Hi guys, it's a very difficult um, portion of scripture, so um, I'm looking forward to what Lesehu is going to say. I'm reading from Titus 1, verse 1 to 4. Paul, a servant of God and apostle of Jesus Christ, for the faith of God's elect and the knowledge of truth that leads to godliness, in the hope of eternal life that God, who cannot lie, promised before time began. In his own time, he has revealed his word in the preaching with which I was entrusted by the command of God our Savior. To Titus, my true son in our common faith, grace and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Savior. This is the word of God. <laughs> Ooh, that sounds nice. Thank you, church. Thank you, church, for indulging me. Um, as I said, my name is uh, Lesejo, and I have the privilege of serving the body of Christ through Fellowship City as an elder, and this morning to open and bring God's word to you. We will be going through the book of Titus over the next four weeks. Um, this week, we're just looking at four verses, just to tee us up, to understand the overview of the book, and to sort of tee us up for the next three weeks. So we're journeying in the book of Titus. At a, young, at a young age, I heard about a man named Dr. Kumalo. You will see his picture behind me. He, he's nicknamed 16V, like a VW Golf. Um, and at the time, these Golfs had an engine. They, they could perform, and he was like that. Uh, he played for Chiefs, and he was instrumental as that engine in the middle of the park, just playing the ball. He was instrumental in how they moved the ball forward, he was instrumental in them winning. He was the hope of Kaiser Chiefs and the national team. He was their savior when we went to AFCON 96. He was celebrated and made known by many. There's an old hot steel pot. Um, this is a well-known addition to many a kitchen. It is celebrated as one that could make pap really well. Um, <laughs> even though it could make pap or putu really well, the cleanup was always a little bit difficult. So this pot was the hope of many a meal. This pot was celebrated for being able to execute that specific task, making pap or putu. L'Oreal cosmetic range, which um, features eyeliners, foundation, and lipsticks, um, and more, obviously, maybe, including anti-aging cream. This is a premium range, which is lauded for providing great results. It is the hope of many a user that they would stop aging as they use these products. The Toyota Fortuna is an off-road vehicle, city and family vehicle. It is a popular vehicle, even amongst our church family. I don't drive one, but I can see the hope that drivers have when they drive this vehicle, taking on flooded areas, curbs, speed bumps, driving over debris on the road, um, and sometimes some gravel roads. Many drivers place their hope in this vehicle. It is the savior of many a trip. When you get stuck, it will move you out, and maybe even parking on an island at a mall. So this morning we engage the book of Titus. We should get a great sense of hope, not on earthly things, but a hope in the eternal, a hope of eternal life that comes from God being our savior. That's the hope we should see this morning as we engage this text. We see this in verses in the first four verses. Verse 2, the hope of eternal life. And verse 3 and 4, God our Savior and Jesus Christ our Savior, respectively. The truth of this hope, which comes from God being our Savior, should also posture us to adorn or beautify or celebrate or make known the name of Jesus who is our Savior. The same way we make known those things we call our hope. The gospel and God being our savior should move us to adorn the name of God, to celebrate the name of God, who is Jesus and savior. So we have three points this morning. Overview and purpose of the book. So we'll look at the whole book in general, and then we'll look at the richness of content and observations for specifically verses one to four. And then we'll look at what does this mean. So our three points, overview and purpose of the book, richness of content and observations from one to four, and what does this mean for us this morning? Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that this morning we have an opportunity to sit and hear from you.
through your word. We know this is how you speak to us in this day and age, and your word tells us those things that we ought to know, to say, and to do. We pray against any distractions this morning, that you would help us to hear you, that you would challenge us, speak to our hearts, that you would encourage us, that you would rebuke us where we need rebuking, and you would draw us near to yourself, Lord God. Help us remember the truth of hope, hope eternal in God our Savior. Let that ring in our hearts, in our minds, as we engage the text, and even as we leave this morning. I pray that you speak through me, speak through my vocal cords. I pray that you would help your people and myself, our hearts collectively, to hear your word. In Jesus' name, amen. As I said, my job this morning is to put into focus the whole book of Titus as an introduction over the series and to specifically expand on the first four verses. So it will be a quick morning this morning. This picture that's behind me is from the Bible Project. It is an overview of Titus. Um, the book was written by Paul, who's primarily writing to a man named Titus. We will get back to more detail about Paul, about Titus, when we sort of engage the first four verses. As an overview, it was written by Paul, writing to Titus. The book of Titus is called a pastoral epistle, meaning it's a, it's a letter written to individuals regarding church governance and discipline. There's three of these letters, Titus, Timothy 1 and 2, and then Titus, which Paul wrote. So Titus is made out of three chapters, with the first chapter including an introduction, same as what Paul would do when he writes to any audience. It includes an introduction, and then there's three chapters within this book. The first chapter's main point, or instruction, is for Titus to appoint elders in Crete and why the elders are needed which is to guard doctrine because the Cretans are liars, evil beasts, and lazy gluttons. That was, that's what we hear from the text. Paul also sets out the guidelines or parameters of who can be considered an elder in chapter 1. So that's chapter 1. Appointing elders to guard doctrine and to teach. Chapter 2 shows how the elders should be different in what they teach. So it continues on the elders' teaching and teaching the context that they're in. They, need, they are to speak against culture and to point to the gospel because of the motive that's found in Titus chapter 2, verse 11 to 14. We'll see that piece of text as we go on. So Titus 2, verse 11 to 14 is the motive in which they ought to share the gospel. That motive should produce an effect. That motive should produce an effect, and that effect is seen in Titus 2, verses 10, which is to adorn the name of of God, who is Savior. So chapter 3 then speaks about more ways in which elders must be different in what they teach, and it highlights the motive again for that. So to recap in an outline of the main verses, you'll see a slide behind me that's got some of the main, main points of the whole book in general. We'll focus on the first few. The main hooks is verses 1 and 4, which we see uh, the introduction of the writer and the main audience. It's important to note as well that in chapter 3, we get um, Paul saying grace and peace to you all, which helps us understand that even though this letter is primarily written to Titus, that the churches in Crete would also hear this and they would read this letter. So Paul says grace and peace to you all. The next one you'll see God and Jesus as Savior and God responsible for eternal life. So you'll see that in verses 2, 3, and 4. So hope of eternal life, God and Savior, God as Savior and Jesus as Savior. Those are important hooks to the overall letter. Then verse 5 starts with the reason why Paul is writing, and Paul mentions that that is why he left uh, Titus in Crete, which means they were together there. They were teaching, they were moving throughout Crete, establishing churches. They were not on holiday, hitting all the beaches and tourist attractions. They were establishing churches, and Paul leaves Titus there to continue the work and to appoint elders in every town because there were false teachers in Crete. And we've just seen that verse that speaks about that. They were dishonest. They were liars, vicious beasts, and lazy gluttons. And that is why Paul is instructing Titus to do this work. Paul's mission then is for elders to be appointed because of this and to guard the doctrine. So I spoke about chapter 2, verse 10. So that in everything they may adorn 
the doctrine of God our Savior. This is the hook over the whole, the whole book. As we read it, that's what should be the effect of this passage, chapter, type, uh, Titus 2 verse 11. And you'll see it behind me there. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions, and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age, waiting for our blessed hope the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. So as I mentioned, chapter 2, verse 10 is the effect of the cause of this book, which is Titus chapter 2, verse 11 to 14. So we'll grapple with those ideas over the next few weeks, but that's important for you to understand as we overview the book. So let's double click verses 1 to 4, which is why we're sitting here this morning. So we understand the overview, we understand sort of the main purpose, um, and now we're looking at zooming in to verses 1 to 4. We get a richness of content in verses 1 to 4 in this introduction, not like many other introductions that Paul that Paul gives. In this introduction, there's quite a lot of rich content in this in those first four, four verses. Let me read them for us as we as we tackle them. Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Christ of Jesus Christ, for the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth that leads to godliness, in the hope of eternal life that God, who cannot lie, promised before time began. In his own time, he has revealed his word in the preaching with which I was entrusted by the command of God our Savior. To Titus, my true son in our common faith, grace and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Savior. Paul was a servant of God. The Greek word used here is doulos. This means slave or bond servant. Basically, Paul had fully committed his life to follow God's commands. He had fully committed his life to follow God's command. That's what it means to be a slave of God, to do what God has called you to do, not to be a slave to the worldly passions or slave to yourself, but to be a slave to the commands of God. Paul is an apostle. This means someone who has seen the resurrected Christ. Titus is not an apostle because he did not see the resurrected Christ. There are no apostles in this day and age. When you hear us at Fellowship City speak about apostles or say that some apostles, we are referring to apostle with a small a. We are referring to someone with a gifting as such of an apostle, someone with a gifting that's more inclined to create networks, to establish networks that's task-driven, someone who is sent to transfer the gospel from one area to the other. So just to make, make sure that we are aware, at Fellowship City, we, we don't believe there's apostles who've seen Jesus Christ exist, but we believe that some people will have gifts in a similar fashion to what an apostle would be. Paul was also a teacher. We see this in, in verse 3. He was entrusted to share the gospel by God, who he calls my Savior. So the first three verses of Titus, they start and end with who Paul is. They speak about the character and person of Paul. He is a servant of God. He is an apostle of Jesus. And that we see in the first line, in the opening lines. And he's entrusted to teach and preach by God his Savior. You will see there's a slide behind me with some red underlines. That will show that the first and the the last line of these first three verses, we see that Paul is a servant of God, apostle of Jesus, and is entrusted to teach. I'm trying really hard to not say it's a burger with a center that is good, but definitely between what Paul, the character of Paul that's mentioned there, there's definitely a picture of God in the middle. So Paul starts and ends with himself, and then we find God in the middle of all of that. There are four points in the middle about God. The first point, God makes a promise of eternal life. Paul, a servant of God and apostle of Jesus Christ, 
for the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth that leads to godliness in the hope of eternal life that God who cannot lie promised before time began. The promise of eternal life is made by a God who cannot lie. This is not like the promise that we would have heard that we were going to pay for ETOS through the San Rao collection method, which the government implemented 10 years ago. This is not like the advert you would see detailing the battery life of your favorite device, um, if it does not originate from the fruit group, that is. This is not like ESCOM saying load shedding is suspended, because we know it's not. This promise of eternal life is made by a God who does not lie. This is the same as we would have seen in Hebrews 6, and I would encourage you to read it. That, that also speaks about God and the promise of Abraham. We're not going to read it because of time this morning. This promise in verse 2 of Titus is made by a God who doesn't lie, who sent Jesus to die on the cross for both your sin and my sin. The God who, after three days, fulfilled prophecy with Jesus Christ rising from the dead. The Apostle Paul saw Jesus rise on the third day for both your sin and my sin. So first point, promise of eternal life before time began by a God who doesn't lie. Second point, hope of eternal life. So God made this promise of eternal life before the ages began. Verse 3, in his own time he has revealed his word in the preaching with which I was entrusted by the command of God our Savior. So this hope of eternal life is revealed in his word through preaching and teaching by those who have been entrusted to preach and teach by God. Hope of eternal life. Promise of eternal life before the ages began. Third point. Paul says God our Savior. He was also saved by God, to which he is now a slave to God's commands, to preach and teach, to share the gospel, which is hope of eternal life. So first promise, promise of eternal life by a God who doesn't lie, promised before the ages began. Second point, hope of eternal life, revealed through preaching and teaching. Third point, God is Savior. And last point, Paul, who is a teacher and apostle, is convinced by the gospel he preaches because he, has, he was entrusted to do so. And he preaches, and as he preaches, people's faith is built. And knowledge of the truth grows, which ultimately helps and leads to godliness. So we see in the first verse, Paul, a servant of God and apostle of Jesus Christ, for the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth that leads to godliness. This faith and knowledge of the truth that leads to godliness comes from the preaching and the teaching of God's word. So our role as teachers or preachers is to share the word of God faithfully and the Holy Spirit to build up people's faith. And the Holy Spirit will build up people's faith, grant them knowledge about the truth, and the Holy Spirit builds up godliness. So that's what we see in those first three verses. We see the identity and character of Paul, and in the middle we see God. God who does not lie, who promised eternal life before time began, who is the hope of eternal life because he is God and Savior. So verse 4, we are introduced to Titus. To Titus, my true son in our common faith. That's, a, that's what it reads. The relationship that Paul and Titus share is like one of a father and son. Titus was drawn into ministry by Paul, and they also share a common faith. That's what we see in the text. So the same gospel that Paul is preaching is what Titus, Titus believes. Verse 4 ends with a greeting. Grace and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Savior. Paul uses a similar greeting in most of his letters. Grace and peace. However, he uses Savior here again. This is important for Paul as he's emphasizing that Jesus is the Savior. He is the reason why Paul is preaching. The essence of the whole letter is to remember that in everything to adorn the doctrine of God our Savior. So a few observations from the text. God the Father chose to save people in the past. And the two references of election in this text. So verse 1, Paul says, is a servant and apostle for the faith of God's elect. And verse 2, before time began. So election simply means chosen. 
So several times in the New Testament, the word election or cho- cho- chosen is used, like we would see in Ephesians 1 verse 4. He chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and blameless before him. So how is this election a reality? This choosing or election required God to be savior and for us to be saved. What are we being saved from? We are being saved from sin and fruitlessness, being saved from ourselves. God the Father and Jesus Christ are both mentioned as savior in this first four verses. The Father and Son work together but are distinct. God the Father chose his people and the Son came as man to live and ultimately die for his people. And that is why they're both mentioned here in this chapter. So the Father chose the people for himself to save these people. At the right time, he sent the Son, Jesus Christ. Then the grace of God appeared to redeem a people for himself. That's Jesus Christ coming. The risen Christ then appointed people, including Paul, to preach and teach about this truth. What does this mean for us? We are descendants of Abraham because of the promise from God that the descendants of Abraham would be many and he would be their God and we are included. So if you have accepted Christ as Lord and Savior, then you are the elect. You are his people and he is your God. Christ died for you. Second observation, Jesus Christ, our Lord, Savior for those who believe and hope in eternal life. So those that have placed their hope in being reunited with Jesus, he saves us from sin and separation from God. We know this from the whole Bible story. God created everything and it was good. Sin entered the world through Adam in Genesis 3 and because of this, no one can live up to God's standard revealed in his commands. God makes a plan on the cross for our sins, reuniting us with God. And this is prophecy fulfilled. That's Jesus on the cross for our sins. We then have eternal life, life with him. And how do we hear about this? How do we hear about Jesus dying for us and eternal life? We hear this from those God has entrusted to share this. They only need to present the truth of God Faith is built because of the knowledge of that truth through the Holy Spirit. This then leads to godliness as the Holy Spirit continues to work. Godliness is not built from do's and don'ts. It is built from heart change that comes from knowledge of the truth which leads to godliness. So reading the Bible and being saturated in the word of God is the only way to become more godly because the Holy Spirit will work as we read the word of God. The Center of Bible Engagement conducted a study using 40,000 people throughout the study. They were not looking specifically for these stats, but they they came up with some really impressive stats. If you read the Bible once a week, nothing happens. This is what they tested over a group of 40,000 people. Nothing happens. If you read it three times a week, they say something happens, but Not quite much. The real change happens when you start reading four times a week. That's what the study says. People throughout the study who were reading their Bibles four times a week had some of these stats. Feeling lonely dropped by 30%. So People stopped feeling lonely because they were reading their Bible four times a week. Anger issues dropped by 32%. Bitterness in relationships dropped by 40%. Alcoholism dropped by 57%. Feeling spiritually stagnant drops by 60%. Because if you're spiritually stagnant, you should be going to the Word of God. It drops 60% if you're reading four times a week. Viewing pornography drops by 61%. Sex out of marriage drops by 68%. And here's two really amazing stats. Sharing your faith jumps by 200%. 200% sharing your faith jumps if you're reading your Bible four times a week. If you're engaged and immersed in the Word of God, if the Word of God is teaching you, 
discipling others jumps by 230%. Knowledge of the truth leads to godliness. And that knowledge is found in the apostles' teaching and from scripture. Knowledge of the truth leads to godliness and that knowledge is found in the apostles' teaching and from scripture. Three things as we close. We should have confidence and hope. We should be changed and we should look forward to eternal life. The letter has three chapters that I mentioned, but Paul repeats the word Savior multiple times in each chapter. Twice in the first four verses, this is a big theme for Paul. The people of Crete should know that Jesus Christ is Savior. They should know that he is Lord. In chapter 3, Paul mentions Jesus as Savior twice again in chapter 3. Chapter 3, verse 4 reads, But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, he saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior. Jesus Christ our Savior is our hope for eternal life. Paul also includes hope in each chapter. Once in the first four verses. Our Jesus being our blessed hope in chapter 2. And hope of eternal life in chapter 3. So hope finds in each of the three chapters. This is important to Paul. That the people of Crete know that Jesus is a savior and is our blessed hope. It is important for us to know that Jesus is our savior and he is our blessed hope. Hope of eternal life. Especially in a time where we may not be hopeful, in a time when we may be skeptical, in a time where we may be sitting here this morning or listening in on audio podcasts or YouTube. If you don't know Jesus as Savior, you may not have hope. But he may be calling you, calling you to a relationship with him. He may be tugging at your heart now. We live in a time similar to Crete. Verse 12 says there are many rebellious people, dishonest, deceptive people. Liars, evil beasts, and lazy gluttons. We just have to turn on the TV and radio, look at the newspaper, and we see this. In society, maybe even in family relationships. There is hope. Hope for eternal life, when all pain and hurt will cease. Where we will be with Jesus, who is Lord and Savior. This book should give us hope. It should give us a great confidence, even as we engage the first four verses. We should remember each week as we look at each section that in every section we should adorn the name, we should adorn the doctrine of God our Savior. Adorn simply means to make something more beautiful or attractive. J.C. Rao says the immense importance of adorning the doctrine of God our Savior and making it lovely and beautiful by our daily habits and tempers has been far too much overlooked. There needs to be an importance in us magnifying the name of God because he's Savior. If we know this and understand this, we should be magnifying the name of God. We adorn the doctrine of God our Savior by letting the knowledge of truth make us godly, by being immersed in the gospel so that it changes us from the inside out. We do this by sharing the doctrine of God as our Savior. When you hear about this new TikTok video, or new anti-aging cream, or new runners, um, we share this with the world. We share these concepts with the world. Runners as in um, running shoes, not chicken feet. Even though if you find good chicken feet, you should share this with the world. This is the mark of signs of a healthy church, a church that is transformed by the gospel, because the people are transformed by the gospel. A church that adorns the name of the Lord. A church that adorns the doctrine of God as Savior because they believe that God is Savior. And they proclaim that. They believe in the hope of eternal life because God is Savior. And they share that. Charles Spurgeon says, Let us never think we have learned the doctrine until we see its fruit in our lives. The doctrine of God as Savior for the believer should be a sweet remembrance of what Jesus has done and the eternal life we can look forward to. Eternal life is for those who are God's elect, those with knowledge of the truth that produces godliness.
Let's pray. Let's take a few moments of silence before before I pray. And you may want to to pray silently or speak to God. And after a moment, I will I'll pray for us. Lord, we thank you for the hope of eternal life. Because of Jesus Christ, our Savior. We thank you that even though we could do nothing to fix our relationship with you, that you sent Jesus Christ to die on the cross for our sins. And that is how we can enter into this eternal life, because of the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. We pray that this would be true of us and true in our hearts, that these words would resonate in our hearts that God is Savior, that Jesus Christ is Savior, and that because of that, we have hope in eternal life. I pray that your words would, would ring true in our hearts, that our words would produce godliness, because your word is knowledge of the truth. I pray that you'd help us through your Holy Spirit to saturate ourselves with your word, to saturate ourselves with your word so that godliness may be produced, so that we may see the fruit of us understanding the doctrine of God our Savior. And we can only see this by sitting under the, the teaching of the apostles, by sitting under your word, by letting the Holy Spirit continue to do its work in us. Let us, Lord, be a church that adorns the name of God our Savior, a church that believes so much in the hope of eternal life and God our Savior, that we proclaim this wherever you've placed us. Lord, I pray that as we depart this morning that these words would ring true of our hearts. Hope of eternal, hope of uh, eternal life because of God our Savior. May we be encouraged, may we be spurred on to share this truth, to adorn the name of God our Savior. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Mm-hmm.